there's no upper limit. Like you can continually explore more and more and more. You can get more intense, longer duration. Like there's limitlessness there. So I feel like that the odds are in your favor. I'm Regina Thomashauer, and this is the Lifestylist Podcast. Well, you are in for a treat today, ladies, and especially inquisitive gentlemen. This is episode 403. Now, before we begin, I want to alert you to the fact that this conversation is adult-themed, so if you have little ones nearby, you might want to give it a listen another time. Today's guest is the incomparable Mama Gina, author of Pussy, A Reclamation. And we'll be talking about sacred feminine power and the lost womanly arts. Show notes, links, and written transcripts for today's episodes can be located by visiting lukestory.com slash mama Gina. That's G-E-N-A. And thankfully, this episode is sponsored by these amazing brands, Inside Tracker, Timeline Nutrition, Juve, and Magnesium Breakthrough. Our guest, Regina Thomashauer, a.k.a. Mama Gina, is a teacher and best-selling author, mother, and media personality. She's also founder and CEO of the School of Womanly Arts, which began in her living room in 1998 and has since grown into a global movement. She believes that women are the greatest untapped natural resource on the planet and that as people of all genders reclaim the magnificence of the feminine, we can all find our true nature and thrive as one. Thomas Shower's approach stems from decades of research in the social, cultural, and economic history of women. Her distinctive style, at once reverent, unwavering, affirming, and very sweary, as I warned you, has engaged thousands of folks like you from all over the world. And in addition to leading the School of Womanly Arts, Thomas Shower has authored four popular books, including her newest New York Times bestseller, Pussy, A Reclamation, and has been featured widely as a leading expert in modern feminism. She lives and works in New York City, but we were fortunate enough to host her here in our Austin studio for this expansive conversation. And for those of you who want a deeper immersion with Mama Gina after this episode, she invites you to explore her Virtual Pleasure Boot Camp. It's a course which can be found at virtualpleasurebootcamp.com as well as in the show notes. And here is a brief preview of the interview to follow. Before we start, I'll remind you again of the adult themes in this episode and the event that you or someone nearby has sensitive ears or emotions. We cover much of the content in her incredible latest book, and we also talk about how men can deepen their understanding of the feminine. Then Regina shares some pleasure practices women can use to reclaim their power. We also talk about circumcision and its role in fostering widespread male insensitivity understanding the arc of masculine and feminine polarity and how this can help us create more radiant relationships. How earlier versions of feminism sold to us as female empowerment have actually done a huge disservice to women. We also discuss the alternative to equality between genders and how both men and women can find power and divinity in their differences. The difference between flirting and hustling, as in the manipulative seductress archetype, and Regina offers her definition of a radiant relationship and how you can create one of your own. And my friends, this is but a small taste of this very juicy episode, so I highly encourage you to give it a thorough listen. But before we go off the deep end here with Mama Gina, I'd like to invite you to another powerhouse episode coming next week with Dr. Kelly Brogan. It's called Free Your Mind and Your Soul Will Follow, a liberation celebration. So if you want to make spiritual and psychological sense of the past two years of cultural and societal madness, next week's show is sure to help. So make sure you subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss next week's episode or any episode to follow. Okay, now I'd like to invite you to open your heart and mind to the wisdom and incredible humor of Mama Gina. People love to call me Mama Gina. Yeah, they love to call me Mama. Well, it's it's, fu- it's really cute. Like people that are like my friends, they, you know, they're like Mama, get over here, Mama. You know, it's funny. I often refer to women as like, "Hey, Mama." I know, and and I don't, you know, young women, older women, whatever. Um, my my wife and I'm sometimes when I'm I say it, I'm like, "Do do they like that?" So far, no woman has ever been like, "Don't call me that." Mm-hmm. I didn't know if it's somehow derogatory or something. Like, what's up, Mama? You know, I kind of like it. Yeah, I've I've I have um, a friend who's from the DR, and uh, she and her husband call the little ones 
mommy, come over here, mommy. Like it's so really? it, like, like I guess it's like M-A-M-I, oh, okay. but it's such a cute thing. You know, well, I, I, there's something really primal about the yeah. ma thing. Right. That it just brings us right. home. It makes us feel love. Yeah. Or connection. I think that's what it is. It's some kind of like longing for connection. And yeah. To that beautiful feminine space of love. And yeah, yeah it's, it's just like, it's so cute. And people, I, it just, it's like an easy, instant connection, warmth, embrace kind of love space, like the best of what mama is. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. When did you um, start using the the name Mama Gina? I know it's funny. I, okay. It was so by accident because when I was first teaching my classes, I like whenever we start, I'm sure this was the case with you and probably with all your listeners, you know, who are creative people diving into their own expressions in the world. But when I was first starting, I was writing all kinds of classes. And then when I had my daughter, Maggie, um, I was nursing her and I was, which is painful at first. You'll, you guys will learn that. That's what I hear. And so, and I'm trying to distract myself. So I'm watching something uh, on a movie and it turns out that it's a movie about courtesans. It's called Dangerous Beauty. You talk about that a lot in your book. Yeah. Yeah. And so the mother is saying to the daughter, if you want to give pleasure, you must know pleasure. And for me, that was like light bulb moment. And I was like, whoa, that's what women need. We, you know, we're so used to taking care of our husbands, our kids, our bosses, all of our friends, making sure everybody's okay, but we don't ever explore and study pleasure ourselves. So I am going to open a courtesan academy in New York City, and I am going to call myself, hmm, Mama Gina. I'm going to be Mama Gina because I just had a baby. So mama makes sense. Yeah. And but I had no idea that it was gonna stick because I was writing courses and they'd come and they'd go. But Mama Gina School of Womanly Arts. And I started with 10 women in my living room. And that thing just took on a life of its own. And within like a year, I was on the front page of the style section in the New York Times. I got like 10 or 12 book offers. I was on Conan, the Today Show, 2020, like it had legs, Yeah, which um, when you're creative, you don't know exactly which thing that you create is going to be your destiny. You just keep creating and then somehow it reveals itself to you. So I didn't, it was kind of tongue in cheek, the mama thing, because I wasn't really an experienced mama. It was just starting. It wasn't really. You're like, I'm just learning how to breastfeed. Yeah. I qualify. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I felt such a strong sense of responsibility when my daughter was born to the girls of today, the women of tomorrow. I felt so much gratitude to my ancestors because it made me feel like part of this lineage, which I hadn't felt so profoundly until I had my baby girl that. Uh, of all the women who, on whose shoulders I rest, that I'm able to do the work that's mine to do. And I, and I felt so much responsibility to think about how can I make a world that can handle who and what a woman is? Because the world does not have any idea who and what yeah. a woman is. Yeah. And so I thought I got to do my part because I have a girl. So yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. I, um, I, I relate to that in terms of having this platform. Mm-hmm. Um, over the years I've, I, and I think also just moving closer into being a parent, hopefully <laughs> mm-hmm. working on it, but, and also just being in love with an incredible woman. Mm. I've really, mm-hmm. I'm just so curious about learning about women. I've done a lot of shows about, you know, birth practices and all of this stuff and being a man, you know, sometimes I ask myself like, why am I leaning into this so much? And I, I think a lot of it, aside from just my personal desire to just learn and expand who I am as a man, it's really connecting to the future of our species, right? right. It's like, it's so important for women to understand themselves and for men to understand women um, because the kids are coming out of the women, right? Yeah, exactly. And that initial bond, you know, and knowing yeah. what a positive impact my own mom had on me. I was mostly raised by my mom. Mm-hmm. And um, so many of the positive attributes in my character are 
were directly from her, you yeah. know, just in terms of, um, I mean, a lot of things really, but primarily the way I relate to people and just empathy and compassion and kindness and just those really nur beautiful, nurturing, feminine energy mm -hmm. aspects. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the only way I've survived <laughs> this world is having, you know, an ability to be in touch with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then to find balance, which I know is like a lot of what your work is about also is is not um, kind of polarizing the male and female against one another, but rather like identifying these energies within us and learning how to be complementary. Yeah, and I think that uh, right now, where we are in terms of an evolving culture is the voice of the masculine is super loud right now, and the voice of the feminine is mm, a little too soft for there to be balance. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so my work is really about like pumping up. Because <laughs> uh, I look at women, I feel like yeah. women are the greatest untapped natural resource on this planet. And uh, it's so I wanted to invest in the voices of women just to, to bring it into balance somewhat. Because when it's out of balance, um, I have a friend named Lynn Twist, and she tells this story, which is about the, the bird of happiness, and that right now the masculine wing of the bird is very powerful and strong, and the feminine wing is very weak and tiny. And so what happens is the bird flies around in circles, because both its wings aren't equal. Oh, that's a great analogy. It's, isn't yeah. it? It's, yeah. And so I feel like my task is to really... Uh, deliver women a reflection of their own magnificence, their own power, their own voice, their own sensual brilliance, so that uh, the kind of the cosmic part of happiness can fly in balance, and then we can uh, take each other higher, which is always the goal. Well, you're doing a great job of it, and uh, I, I read you. your, no, I listened to your book this week. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and A, you're an incredible writer. I've been Thank you in the that. process of writing a book for a year <laughs> while trying to finish this house. So there's, there's, oh my goodness. there's more house going than there is book, but it's, you know, I sit down and work on a chapter and I'm like, wow, um, I have a greater appreciation for, for writers. And um, mm -hmm. one thing I noticed about your writing that is something that I struggle with a bit, I guess, because I'm, I've not started editing the things I'm writing. I'm just like, don't edit. Yeah, I don't. No, no I don't. Just like let it I'm dump. Annie Lamott, dump, bird dump, by bird. Dump. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you, read or hear the the finished product of a great writer there's such an economy of words mm -hmm. and i'm a mm -hmm. very wordy speaker mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. writer mm -hmm. so it's it's been um yeah it's it's been a great instruction with with your book to see like ooh, it's like only what really matters ends yeah. up on the page or yeah. you could, the kind of books where you can take almost any sentence or you know a, a part you. of a paragraph and be like boom yeah that's, but but that, know that's a this, teaching, you know? Know this, Luke, like the book was three times as long. Okay, good. <laughs> <I feel bad. laughs> so just keep going, keep yeah. doing what you're doing. And then yeah. eventually between you and your editor, it starts to come together. Yeah, I, I have a writing coach and she turned me on to the, the book Bird by Bird. Um, and I also interviewed um, Stephen Pressfield, who uh, wrote a book called The War of Art. And both of them have a similar um, sort of tactic in that way that you just like get everything out. Then later on you come back and fine tune it. So, mm -hmm. so I've managed to do that as mm -hmm. irresistible as it is sometimes to go in and like start tweaking on something. It's mm -hmm. like, no, I just want to get everything out. Uh, but anyway, the book is incredible and listening to it as a male too was so interesting because it's like, I was able to reflect on all of the women that I've known in my life. Yeah. And, um, just to see how many of them have been um, robbed of the experience yeah. of their full expression. Yeah. And many of them because of me, you know what I mean? I mean, I didn't think about it in those terms, but just mm -hmm. more, more broadly, like thinking about my mom and my wife and mm -hmm. women that I've dated and worked with and women that have worked for me that I've worked for, just all of those interactions and just seeing kind of how you are in touch with that spirit and with mm -hmm. the word that you use so liberally pussy i'll be the first one to drop it in this conversation mm -hmm. i'm sure it's going to be used a lot but just thinking about those women and going oh my god most women have no idea that this this realm even exists exactly. right exactly and so it was 
it's probably something I'm going to read or listen to again, really. And of course, especially when you have your daughters. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just, it's been a powerful experience just digging into that. I mean, I've spent a lot of time with it this week and been hopefully very thoughtful about kind of preparing what I wanted to talk about, but yeah, yeah, it gave me a whole new appreciation. It's been very, very educational. Yeah. I'm so glad. So I think this conversation and your work for any men that saw the title of whatever this podcast is. And was like, ah, that one's for the ladies. I mean, I think this is really important work for men too, Mm -hmm. to really have a a deeper understanding. I chose to, like I, when I first started my, my work, I was teaching classes for men and for women. And then I chose to focus on women because, um, you know, since the culture is patriarchal and so, um, women are, uh, deprioritized and disparaged and, you know, it's hashtag me too in this generation. And there's, uh, women are paid 79 cents on the dollar that men make. And all of those things are truth. But I also recognize it through my own journey that it was up to women, right? We, we can't be awakened by a man. The awakening has to happen sister to sister, pussy to pussy, woman to woman. It has to be that a within a circle of women, a woman can not only find her own magnificence, but cultivate it. And then she brings that, like once she knows she's queen, once she knows that she's divine, once she knows she's sacred, then that transmits. You know, if a woman walks into a room and um, she's filled with self-doubt, self-deprecation, self-hatred, she's like spreading this virulent condition of self-doubt, self-hatred, self-deprecation to the her daughters who might be in the same room, to the her, her sisters. Like, we're learning this unspoken language that women are victimized right now. But once a woman changes that dialogue within herself, she connects to her pussy, she connects to she who bleeds but does not die and gives life. She connects to her sacred feminine. She connects to her wild, to her uh, just incandescent, that eternal radiance that is the feminine. Once she knows and owns that, when she walks into a room and she knows she's divine, she knows she's magnificent, she spreads the virulent condition of we are all divine. We are all magnificent. We are sisters. And that's an, a way of elevating the world by doing nothing but being wonderful. <laughs> totally. Well, that's, uh, there's, that, there's like 10 offshoots in what you just said that I think <laughs> I'm like, okay, remember, let the guest talk, Luke. <laughs> this show and my lifestyle in general is all about achieving maximum health on all levels, mental, emotional, spiritual, and of course, physical. When it comes to the physical, I do my best to avoid guesswork, which is why I love this company, Inside Tracker. They've created an ultra personalized performance system that analyzes data from your blood, DNA, lifestyle, and even fitness tracker to help you optimize your body and reach your wellness goals. Getting all this info about your body adds an exponential level of precision and customization to your Inside Tracker action plan. And when it comes to biomarker testing, I want to go for the max level of health, not the average. For example, my recent Inside Tracker testing revealed that my inner age is 47, which is cool because I'm currently 51. But I also found that my cortisol and LDL cholesterol was high. Fortunately, my vitamin D was optimized, probably because I get out in the sun so often, as were my magnesium and inflammation markers. So I had a little bit of work to do. And the cool part about getting this info is now I can use their app and web platform to improve based on their personalized diet, supplement, and fitness recommendations. So with Inside Tracker, you can track your progress and adjust based on real-time feedback from your body. Then you retest every three months to see what's working and maybe more importantly, what's not, or even adjust your goals to develop a new action plan. This is an awesome tool for those of us wanting to make the best use of our time and money when it comes to being healthy. And you, my friends, can get on board right now and get yourself optimized. Just go to insidetracker.com slash Luke, where you will save 25% off the entire Inside Tracker store. So again, just use the link insidetracker.com slash Luke.
there's there's so many things in there, but you know, something that I've been working with with my wife Allison since we moved here. She just wrote a book. It's it's right here. It's called Animal Power. I always mm-hmm. have it up here to help promote. I would have had your book, but I only had the digital copy. But uh, you know, she just birthed this book. Right, it took a year. It was just a whole maybe two years actually. This mm-hmm. whole thing, uh, which I was privy to the process, and now. Um, we want her to just kind of bask in that success and to just relax. And I'm out being very proactive and kind of handling business, you know, and she lived in Brooklyn for 15 years and, you know, has just really made a career for herself and a name for herself and accomplished so much, but was in a very yang energy right. in so doing. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's been really um, a great teaching for us as a couple to help her to understand that the the reverence and the love and approval from me for and to her is not based on any metric of performance. It's like the more she is what you just described, the more I want to be in service of that. Mm-hmm. It's about who she is and the radiance of that entity in its entirety that motivates me to hold space and work and you know mm-hmm. produce right and do the things i'm doing right. like or my remember, love is not based on her production or right, anything that she's she does living inside a world that values her for her production that values yeah. her for all of those masculine qualities and undervalues the feminine qualities like you know why um uh oh, oh i have one student in my um, my work that she um got her you know she's a lawyer she passed the bar but she didn't want to practice she didn't have to she was married to a guy that wanted to take care of her but because of the cultural pressure she got a job because she couldn't handle the pressure of people not viewing her as worthy because of what she was doing you know, as opposed to who she was being or uh, the other places she could have used her time and attention and her life. So it's, um, but we're making progress. Yeah, that's a lot of conditioning it's to break so through. Much. I look at something I notice in this realm is, you know, I'm 51 now and over the course of my lifetime, I mean, there were years when I was young when I wasn't that socially aware, but as I've kind of looked back, how... The idea, for example, of um, being a homemaker for a woman mm-hmm. is like so devalued, I know. right? It's yeah. like, and now that we're building a home and looking into having a family, <laughs> and I know so many women here that have mm-hmm. kids, you know, some of them have careers and are doing things in the world as well. But mm-hmm. um, I would say most of the mothers that I know have prioritized being a mom and, yeah. you know, right. creating I mean, that. And it's like, many of them have to fight against this yeah. conditioning that they're somehow, yeah, no uh, honor in that or something. Yeah. I'm like, that's maybe the most honorable thing you could do, you know, yeah, is truly, to really commit truly. yourself to that. My daughter who watched me work, you know, cause I was a single parent. And so I ha- raised her on one knee, had my laptop and the running my school on the other. And so she saw the complexity of what I was managing. And she's like, I'm not doing that mom. I am not, I am going to like get married and I want to have a family and I don't want to be using my entire life working like you did. So it's the pendulum swings. And I hope that she has that opportunity to really just like give herself to um, cultivating a home and having kids and all the things she longs for. Yeah, me too. And that, that radiance that you speak of from a woman who's truly embodied like that Mm -hmm. As a man, I don't. I don't know that many women understand how motivating that is. It's irresistible, yeah. isn't it? It's like when, especially <sighs> in the context of a romantic relationship, when it's devoid of competition, mm-hmm. there's it's so much juicier. Yeah, you know, and it's just yeah. And we as no women, s- we don't know that we have <laughs> access to that portal right. because when it, it's really like a woman who owns her pussy owns her life. And if she doesn't, she doesn't. And it cuts that way. And we don't understand that. Well, if you think about it, you know, um, we're encouraged to build these careers or uh, work really hard. We don't spend the time to really investigate how to connect 
with our sacred sensual power, how to even explore what pleasures us, what turns us on, what lights us up. Uh, you know, we we don't live in a in a culture that encourages that with women, and we're this culture actually actually disconnects us from our sexuality, which is like home base for a woman to build her confidence and kind of uh, learn about her own body and her own sensual evolution. And it's crucial, but we don't get a lot of time or space to even connect with that, which is what all of my work is about. My school is like literally like boot camp for a woman's pleasure and a woman's sensuality and a woman to really relax in the exploration of her desires in a community of sisterhood. Where, which is such a beautiful greenhouse for all those things to grow. That sisterhood thing you touched on earlier, I'm it, since there's such a tight knit community of like minded folks here in Austin. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this just incredibly powerful, amazing women here uh, that are just abundant, as I'm sure there are in many places. But mm-hmm. for some reason, a it lot seems of them especially are, going on <laughs> yeah. here. I agree with you. But there'll be times like um, when when my wife is you know just moving through something and. You know, I can give all of the time, attention, space, listening, holding, whatever is... By the way, congratulations, because most men cannot do that. Most men want to fix us. Oh, and it is horrible idea. A really horrible <laughs> no. idea. No. So keep on with your space holding. Yeah. It's beautiful. But what, what I was getting at was um, sometimes, you know, what, what I arrive at in terms of like how I can offer support is with throwing out the idea hey honey maybe it'd be great to go sit in ceremony with some of your sisters Mm -hmm. like go connect Mm -hmm. with some ladies you know not Mm -hmm. because i want her out of the house or i can't handle it but i just know there's something that i can't give Mm -hmm. her and it's what you describe Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and then she comes back and it's just she's totally grounded again and Mm -hmm. everything's cool Mm -hmm. you know yeah you know one of the they're they're kind of what what makes a woman flourish breaks out into three values um and, and our culture skews it. Okay, let me ask you. What do you think is the most important thing for a woman, let's say, um, is it, you know, f- the options being like food and shelter, stuff, attention. Um, what do you think would be the most important? For a woman in her feminine? Or just like any woman. Like what would feed her the most? Um I would say having her feelings and emotions honored and cherished and heard. Yeah, you're right. It's more important than food. It's like huh. the, I just immediately <laughs> discounted food and shelter. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking give, about like... We do not give a shit about it. With like the most important value for women is the category of sex slash attention. Huh. That's what we long for the most. Like we would sell our soul for like a hot, uh, like eternal night of passionate lovemaking in a lean-to shack on a beach somewhere. We'd rather have that than, you know, a million dollars in our bank account. Uh, it's, that's what where a woman comes to life is in the space of sex slash attention. And then her second most important value, of course, is food and shelter. And then the third is stuff, you know. To... In that in that context, do love languages play into that, and how much diversity of preference is there? For example, um, I, you know, I kind of know what my love language is, uh, and various women that I've dated in my life, some of them really love gifts and just feel so. Mm-hmm. Um, but if let's and, say if somebody whose love language was gifts, yeah, that still fun, falls into the category of sex slash attention, because like let's say you send her flowers then she's turned on by that. And then it's like a way of keeping that channel open between the two of you that would lead to some beautiful, Got deeper it. connection. Got it. So maybe the preferences in which those portals are opened vary with people, but ultimately at the core. We want great sex. Yeah. We want mind-blowing sex. We want you to figure out how to like, uh, have us forget who we are because the sex is so crazy and good. That's what we want. Wow. And we want 
we want so much more sex than we are given credit for. Like, <laughs> you know, because it's usually like, well, he, my husband wants sex, so I had that. No, it's like women long for that depth of uh, deep, profound, sensual connection so much. And the difficulty has been we don't know how to teach or guide men to what it is that really lights us up and make us happy. Uh, and guys, sometimes... That's so true. Yeah, we, it, it, yeah. We're, we, we actually, you know, it's, it's so interesting. We're so chatty, right? At dinner, uh, you know, we're going and doing something chatty, chatty. And then when we get in bed, we just clam up and we want you to be able to read our minds rather than us really doing the work of putting the key in our own ignition, turning that baby on, taking her down the highway so we could learn what lights us up, makes us happy, and then we can invite passengers. But we don't, we don't have a lot of mm, fluency around our sensuality because we've been so cut off from, from it. And, you know, we, we aren't even given language for that which is most essentially feminine about ourselves. Most women grow up without a word for down there. You were saying like 50% of the women in your uh, workshops dude, don't even have a name. Dude, we're never given a name It's for so it. scary. And like when you were growing up, you was a penis, right? Um, your yeah, mom would yeah, be like, yeah, probably, yeah. Relate to, you know, but yeah. with women, it's this wacky head trip. It's like so many different crazy words, like pee pee, hoo hoo, uh, pancake, Walter Winchell, uh, knish. Like uh, it's just like a mind blowing list and then the half of women who don't even have a name and what happens there it's it seems like what what's the problem is just a bunch of cute little nicknames or nothing but as jesus said in the beginning there was the word you can't begin anything until you have the language to communicate about it. i mean how would you describe the internet to somebody that had no idea what the like it would take you hours, you know, if you like, well, these waves or I don't know if it's waves or it's <laughs> signals that connect us. Like it would be so hard. And then we're talking about the heart of a woman's sex and sensuality and she isn't given the language for it. And so what takes its place is shame because she feels like, wow, if there's a part of her that can't even be named it must be shameful and she must be wrong. So that um, early experience of feeling shame about her body and feeling wrong, it just only expands over her lifetime. And then she, maybe she goes out on a date with a really well-meaning guy and and he's like, well, what do you like? And she's like, oh, oh God, ooh, why would you even want to touch me there? It's so shameful and wrong. Um, so. It's a problem. <laughs> it's a very well, big, deep and wide problem. Well, your book has this very bold title. And by the way, we'll uh, link to all this at lukestory.com slash mama Gina, G-E-N-A. So your book is called Pussy, or Puss, I can't even say the word, Pussy, Pussy a Reclamation. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I have to admit, you know, in, in listening to the book and, and reading some of your stuff and listening to podcasts you've been on, it's really interesting. I have this, I don't know, like viscerally awkward relationship myself yeah. with that word, yeah. you know? And so I'm kind of yeah. inquiring, well, what other word would one use? Like vagina, uh, that's what, that doesn't, that sounds so clinical. And Well, see, here's the problem with vagina. Cause like the vagina people, they think they're so like evolved cause they can say vagina, but vagina is actually, you. it's not visible. Like if I pulled my panties down right now, you cannot see my vagina unless you get out your speculum, which you don't have cause you're not a gynecologist. Maybe you're kind of kinky at home, but whatever. <laughs> you know, because it's like your vagina is the internal part of your um, sexual apparatus. But it's, you know, the word means sheath in Latin, which is, you know, makes sense. Yeah. So, um, but the exterior genitalia is the vulva. And no one says vulva. But I think that's the word that you want to teach your daughter when you have her. I was going to ask you about yeah. that. Yeah, teach like, her vulva because it's the correct terminology and it contains the outer lips and the inner lips and the clitoris. Oh, interesting. So she'll, okay. you know, it would be the same thing like if you note, taught... Note to self. Yeah, vulva. But yeah, um, she, it would be the same thing like if you taught 
a boy that his penis was called a scrotum. It's just wrong. It's right. just it's called the wrong thing. Yeah. So um, I I like the word vulva. Um, it's clear and it's true. With the word pussy, going back to that, it's like, I, I've been so curious just with myself, like, why do I kind of bristle at mm, that? You know, it's, mm-hmm. and, and I haven't arrived at an answer, um, but I guess it has something to do with the derogatory associations yeah. to which it's been applied. Yep. So I've tried to think of substitutes, you know, the ones out there and none of them do the job. So I'm like, that yeah. must be why she arrived at that title yeah. in her book. Like some people call it a yoni. When I hear that word, I just go like, Ew. Too. it just feels it's corny. Like, and no, it feels weird. No offense like, to women that use that, you know, but. But I don't speak I, Sanskrit yeah, or I've, whatever it is. I've never, I've never identified with that word. So, yeah. so there, I'll tell you why I use pussy. Okay. Because it makes women laugh. Like, you know, I've had, th- I've, my, what I started my living room with 10 women grew into thousands, literally thousands, like Javits Center, two or 3,000 women I would be teaching to. And um, whenever a woman, you know, women have resistance to pussy. It's a fucking pejorative, nasty ass word. Like when you call a guy a pussy, you're basically emasculating him. That's maybe the worst thing you can call a guy. Exactly. You know, and if yeah. you call a woman a pussy, you're objectifying her and sexually, uh, verbally assaulting her. But what happens is when a woman reclaims that word and she owns it and she's like, my neck, my back, lick my pussy and my crack. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is a way in which she's uh, taking her power back. She's saying, okay, you want to call me a pussy? I am a pussy. Like I am standing and, and for some reason it cracks women up. It puts them in a happy mood. They smile. I do not know why I cannot explain the chemistry of it, but it just ignites a woman. It is like taking her power back. And I notice the same thing happens with my actual book, pussy, like women love to give pussy to people. They, they want to be the person that gives pussy to their girlfriend or their husband or their parents, like, because it's a little bit outrageous, it's a little bit radical, and it's owning the power of the feminine in a in a way that's taking possession rather than being objectified or deified for being the holder of the sacred ground called pussy. So well, it's the, a little bit of badassery that's yeah, involved. Yeah, and I, you know, as I said, I just can't find a better substitute. So we're <laughs> we're we're just going to stick with that for the purposes of this conversation. And, and let me let, more me, let me speaking. hear you say pussy again. Pussy. Oh, see, so you're you're saying it. You're owning it. And I have to. I asked you because you can tell. The first time I said it, that was like <laughs> yeah, you did. It was it was a little rough, but you know you you know. I had a practice but, run. Yeah, and. You can tell how much a guy actually loves pussy by the way he says pussy. It's just litmus. You know, I'm not going out with a man who can't say pussy well. Not dating anyone who doesn't say pussy well, like, like he means it. <laughs> to, the, to the anatomical, going back to that, you know, how the vagina is not really a complete description yeah. or correct um, description. I was thinking about the first night I met you here in Austin with, uh, with a, a group of with men. With the dudes. Yeah, and it must have been 45 minutes into this uh, work that we were doing with you where you had a a female volunteer on the table facing the men Mm -hmm. and you are exploring her pussy and giving us a tutorial. Yeah, And I remember sitting there and I had this second where I was like, I want to be able to see and I was off to the side. Yeah. And then, I mean, it was a momentary thing. I worked through it, but I was like, "Ah, I don't want to be that guy that's like goes up. (laughs) I want a front row seat, you know? And then I was Mm -hmm. like, no, I actually do. So I moved and... I could see as well as I could see with with uh, my glasses, but um, I just think of how many. I mean, not you know, obviously the women, but how many men just have myself included. I mean, to this day, I think I've learned something over the years from inquiry and just open communication. But mm-hmm. I think the vast majority of heterosexual men know relatively nothing about a pussy and what pleases it, um, mm-hmm. and there is this. I think we should say her instead of it. Her, okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. not a it. Like that thing. Okay, okay. <laughs> but it it's also as as a man, it's exceedingly difficult at times to oh get God. a woman out of that conditioning oh to tell us, oh. right? 
Oh, dude. And you and you have it's to so be hard. you also have to have a certain degree of um humility, I think, and, mm-hmm. and openness to take direction, right? Mm-hmm. And not be emasculated mm-hmm. from a woman like, do this, don't do that. Mm-hmm. This is what I like, this is what I don't like. Mm-hmm. That can be confronting as a man mm-hmm. too for women that are, you know, that are fully owning that. Mm-hmm. So it's like both sides sort of need to have this, I don't know, some kind of an agreement, right? Where the 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 end goal and intention of it is to enrich that experience yeah. and or that relationship. Yeah. And well, I have to tell you a really cute story. A student of mine, she was from Texas and she had this five-year-old son and I think they'd been married six or seven years and the marriage was tanking, like blowing up and she was about to divorce him. I think she'd hired the divorce attorney and they'd already started the paperwork and then she started my course. And the first weekend of the course is really an immersion in just looking at uh, how do we have just begin to celebrate our bodies, celebrate these pussies that bleed, ovulate, give us orgasms, push baby. Like, how do we start to celebrate this aspect of our body? And then there's a deeper investigation into the anatomy. And then she started to realize, like, I know nothing about my pussy. I, I know nothing nothing, nothing. So how would I expect that I could have a great sex life with my husband if I know nothing and I'm too ashamed to ever let him see my pussy or ever even explore myself or even let him explore? You know, so basically I think they were having like missionary sex with no foreplay because of her Catholic or upbringing that would have her not connect with her sex. So she went home from the weekend feeling empowered. She told him everything that, that she sees that this was missing on her part, that she never opened up to him. So they decide to have a date where he's going to be able to look at her pussy for the first time. So this is how cute her husband is. He gets out of his camping equipment, a little headlamp. <laughs> oh, that's so Isn't good. Isn't that cute? So it's all dark in their bedroom and she does like this little fun sexy dance for him and then he puts on his headlamp and spreads her legs and is able to see her and like he's literally weeping with relief wow. joy and the beauty of her and she is allowing it but once again tagging on to our sisterhood conversation that couldn't have happened without her finding herself in a circle of sisterhood without realizing like, oh, wow, I'm not the only one who's disconnected. The first step of connection is happening in the safe circle of sisterhood. And then I can bring my man into this world. And then uh, the story has a happy ending. They ended up not getting a divorce because they started having intimacy, like real connection and real intimacy that had been missing. Wow. Wow. So, um, what, what are some practical ways that, I mean, I guess y- you lay out, like there was a PDF that came with your, your, um, audio book. And I looked at that and there was, you know, a clear <laughs> diagram of all parts pussy, you know, I was like, okay, I see the outside, mm-hmm. not so much the inside. I mean, in terms of getting to know that, like what, mm. like I've uh, told you before, you know, I've done the, um, orgasmic meditation mm-hmm. that oh mean and you know that's a different kind of energetic yeah. thing not so much an exploration like the demo that you did mm-hmm. what are ways in which a woman could you know get to know that to the point where she could help instruct and inform and bring her partner whether they be male or female into that yeah experience with them well i think the easiest thing is just getting a copy of pussy and then doing the exercise is simple but let's say you wanted to start right now while you're uh, you, listening to the podcast, while you're listening folks. to the podcast, and you're like, "Okay, I'm on it." So I would say the first thing that a woman would do is get home, get, or you could do this in the office restroom if you have a hand mirror. But it's about connecting, like actually looking at your pussy, because you know I would say probably about half the women that take my courses don't ever look at their pussies, like. Maybe their gynecologist does, but they don't because there's so much negativity and shame and misinformation and thinking that that part of our body, it, like, why does it look that way? Or is it supposed to look that way? Um, so if she looks, 
and I have found, Luke, there's five stages that a woman has to make her way through to get to actually love her pussy. The first stage is she's going to grab that hand mirror. She's going to look at her pussy and she's going to be like, oh, whoa, no, yuck. No, I can't handle it. No, it's too much. Like what? Look at all those colors. Uh, the, the pubic hair or the bikini wax. It, it, like I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't because she's so unfamiliar. So that's phase one is upset, disgust. Phase two is she becomes the researcher where she's simply looking and reporting out. So the next day she'll look again and instead of, you know, she'll have worn off her initial charge and then she'll just research and she'll be like, oh, isn't that interesting? My right lip is a tiny bit larger than my left lip. My inner lips protrude somewhat from my outer lips. Oh, look, there's my clitoris. It has a clitoral hood on it. Isn't that interesting? So she becomes a researcher. Then there's the affectionate researcher by day three, where she's like, oh, wow. I'm noticing that as I'm looking at my pussy, because remember, women love attention, pussies love attention. Just looking at a woman's pussy will cause it to engorge, even, even if she's the one looking. So she'll be looking at her pussy, and then she'll notice, ooh, the coloration is deepening somewhat. I can see my outer lips swelling a little bit. My clit is getting a tiny bit bigger. That is amazing. Okay, then day four. She becomes the enthusiastic researcher and she's looking at her pussy again. And then she's saying, you are beautiful. Look at those cute little lips. Your clit is so adorable. Look, And so she's recognizing that with her approval, her pussy starts to respond and engorge and she's enjoying it more and more. And then some women will actually get to the fifth stage, which is rapture where you recognize this is the portal to life. This is the place where the divine and the human join in both the act of creation and recreation and birth, where this is this, I am holding the source of life itself. And even if a woman never pushes a baby out of her pussy, she creates And she creates when she's connected to her sensuality and her sacredness and her divinity. So it's a little bit of a process, but it's it's very possible. It's just I like that. It's 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 practical. Mm -hmm. (laughs) My male brain is like there's steps. There's there's structure there. There's a way to do it. You know, and there's kind of an end goal. You know, Mm -hmm. which makes sense to me. I've been pretty damn obsessed with mitochondria for the past couple years. From blue light hacks to saunas and cold plunges, I'm always after more ATP, our body's main fuel source. And up until now, there haven't been very many supplements on the market to support mitophagy or the flushing out of old, damaged mitochondria. So when I discovered this unique compound called urolithin A, I was super intrigued. It's found in pomegranate, but it's very hard, well, impossible really, to eat or drink enough of it to get the scientifically proven clinical dose. This is where a product called MitoPure from Timeline Nutrition comes in. They've created three ways to get your daily dose of 500 milligrams of urolithin A in their product MitoPure. They've got a delicious vanilla protein powder that combines muscle building protein with the cellular energy of MitoPure and a berry powder that easily mixes into smoothies or just about any drink and finally soft gels for travel. Personally, I love the new starter pack, which lets you try all three forms of MitoPure. This is the first product to offer a precise dose of this compound to upgrade mitochondrial function, increase cellular energy, and improve muscle strength. It actually took 10 years of research to bring this potent product to market, and I'm personally glad it did because it works. Right now is a special offer for my audience. That means you. Use the promo code LUKE10 to get 10% off any 2, 4, or 12-month MitoPure plan at TimelineNutrition.com. That's TimelineNutrition.com. And to learn more about this fascinating discovery, go back and check out episode 389 with Dr. Chris Wrench. It's incredible stuff. You know, in generally speaking, in, in spiritual teachings for people that are 
you know, seeking to kind of um, become more embodied in that way and awaken in that way. Mm -hmm. Most traditions um, indicate that you want to get out of your head, right? Like get out of overthinking, speaking of trying to learn meditation or something. And that, you know, the goal is to kind of move from your head into your heart and Mm -hmm. be heart centered. And in Mm -hmm. in my male journey, um, it's, I think what's served me is getting out of my head when appropriate to do so Mm -hmm. and to really be centered in my heart. And there were times in my life where I was out of balance and so much of my energy was in my cock. I mean, it was just, I was so sexually driven and motivated, uh, which, you know, periodically caused problems in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And I started doing Kundalini yoga a number of years ago for, for many years. And I didn't even have the intention, but that energy started to move up kind of out of my Mm -hmm. sacral zone. And I, I just became much more open-hearted and vulnerable and, Mm -hmm. You know, and I find now my power center is really in my heart. I would never go into the world like, yeah, I'm going to be in my cock energy today. You Mm -hmm. know, it's just like, it doesn't feel motivating Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense. But in your teachings, it seems rather than encouraging uh, a female aspirant at at awakening to be in their heart, but rather their pussy, I find that to be, maybe break break down that. Why? Yeah. And also why that might not be the most effective way for a man to to awaken and be empowered to be stuck down there and performing their life from that energy all right probably can't speak as deeply to the guy thing but let me but it's a really good question i find that like let's say um when women move from their hearts um it's good but very often it's out of balance because it's like it's a give energy it's like looking after another person it's uh it's it's like how can i almost like not connect with the wholeness of who i am uh but just be a giver and why i like teaching women that they could also include their pussy because when you move from your pussy you're including your heart it's like a full body move. Uh, and pussy, when a woman connects with her pussy, she's connecting with her deepest truth, with her intuition, with that part of her that can also it, it almost be psychic. It's like, you know, she it's super, super intuitive when she's plugging into her pussy. Uh, it's kind of like you're, you're, she's activating uh, a gut response that takes care of the whole body woman and by doing so takes care of everyone around her. So she'll, you know, I'm walking home in Brooklyn and thinking like, do I take the subway? Do I take, you know, a taxi? And then I'm, I, I'm like, okay, let me just clock my pussy. And my pussy's like, you know what? That's 11. Actually get on that subway. And then I'll get on the subway. I'll go right down. The train will be there. I'll be home in 15 minutes, which maybe I would have been like stuck in, you know, on the Williamsburg bridge or something for 20 minutes if I took the Uber. So it's like, it's, it's this sort of tapping into a divine connection that includes her heart. It includes her intuition. It includes her sex. It's sort of a full body green light when you include your pussy as well. I think it's probably equivalent for a man. Um, I think that it sounds like you're, you know, when you activated your heart, you're sort of, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of combining cock heart energy because there's times when we really want our guys to be super cocky. Yeah. We love that. Yeah. Well, I I think it, it was interesting to observe within myself that I became increasingly less able to have gratuitous no strings attached sex. Like mm-hmm. I would find myself getting feelings for women <laughs> that I didn't have before. I was really able to divorce myself emotionally. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, and there was a period in which that was appropriate and there were willing mm-hmm. participants that were mm-hmm. on board for that as well. But, right. you know, that was when I started to notice like, huh, something weird is happening to me here where I'm just, I'm becoming just a much more, <laughs> my empathy is getting higher and I'm just becoming yeah. more of a caring person. And, and, that, and I think it's also runs the other way, which is I think you're getting more depth and connection in the experiences you were creating for yourself. It sounds like it, instead of it just being like, you know, um, getting off, it was actually connecting deeply on many levels with 
your sexual partner, which is yeah. a, a more fun ride. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. And I've, you know, continued to allow that to kind of unfold. But mm-hmm. I just thought that was interesting about your work because I thought, well, if I transposed your pussy centric mm-hmm. teaching on myself, I feel like <laughs> I would be very limited, you know, and I would mm-hmm. probably be behaving totally differently in mm-hmm. the world, you know. So yeah, I guess I guess it's a matter of um perhaps for men learning how to find the balance, mm-hmm. you know, of what energy is needed mm-hmm. and what's appropriate in any given mm-hmm. decision or situation. But I, I don't think I would find myself ever walking around making like intuitive decisions based on cock energy. You yeah. know what I mean? I would be, I I'd wonder be more about that. Heart. I don't know. I, you know, you and I are going to have to have a glass of wine and go deeper on this <laughs> because like I, I, with the women that I've worked with over the years, which is literally thousands and thousands, like they will literally use their pussies as an Oracle, as a guide, like to make decisions about really, you know, crucial things in their life. Like for example, taking a job, you know, woman, gets a job offer and it's like great on paper and it's a company that really is would be a great career move um but the office is you know fluorescent cube farm and her pussy is screaming no don't please i cannot work in that environment no you know and but her head is going we have to take this job is you know it's the next thing in our career development advancement and but if she listens to her pussy then and declines that job, something even better will like land right in her lap. Like it's almost like your pussy is sort of the awakener for your evolution. And once like that divine feminine wants to open doors for you, that will open when you pay attention and listen. And I'm sure you've felt that yourself in your life. Like when you, you know, when you're the most surrendered there's opportunities that come that you could not have created for yourself, even if you had tried. Like it would have been impossible because they were just so remarkable that you met the right person at the right time. Of the, and so I, I look at that as the divine feminine just coming in there. And, you know, uh, because when a woman is plugged in, then she gets these, in, she's in flow. And life gets to happen in ways that m- m- she might not have been open to before. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Just thinking about um, being in sort of a, oh, like a systemic mode of surrender, mm-hmm. which is kind of where I'm always <laughs> striving to <Aspiring>. arrive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, that that sense of trust and allowing mm-hmm. um, and, and having that inform the impetus to start something or to make a decision on something and then bringing in a more yang energy to actually do the thing. Right. But I find that, you know, it's like surrendered action is kind of the way that I find myself navigating life most successfully. Yeah. And, and really the whole design of that structure, you know, which is, is built on orgasm, right? Because female orgasm is interesting. It's like, and beautiful. She has the capability with every single stroke to go higher and higher and higher, whether it's a downstroke or an upstroke, whether it's a light, delicate stroke, or, you know, sometimes it's pleasurable to have a, an even more intense stroke. Like there's a range that becomes available to a woman. The more attuned she gets, the more she learns her body, the, her range gets bigger and bigger. And the structure of especially female orgasm because it's different from male you guys have this um you know your cock gets hard and then there's this venous plexus at the base of the cock that keeps that contains the blood flow which is why you get to be hard and then you ejaculate and then there's a refractory period but we don't have a venous plexus so we have this ability to kind of like orgasm and orgasm and orgasm and go higher and higher and peak and peak and peak. It's almost limitless. Uh, my, when I did my training at uh, what was then called Moore University, now it's called Lafayette Morehouse, um, and also with Dr. Stephen Verabedansky, I learned a technique called extended massive orgasm, where I learned how to come for one hour 
<laughs> you talk at about least. that in your book. I felt so <laughs> inadequate at points reading your book. I was like, I've never done that. You know, it's it's super. It's not not because I can't do it, but I don't think I've produced that kind of experience for partners. And I was like, well, oh, you, shit. You, you wouldn't unless you were like, you know, you had a lot of time, bandwidth, and interest in like figuring out, like, wow, how long can we keep this going? So, um, you the and the design of that is it's not just the architecture of orgasm. But it's also, it has to do with, let's say, as a woman, we can, when we can learn to love each stroke, not just of our pussy, but of life, and to feel the gratitude for each opportunity in life, you know, even the ones that are sometimes difficult or challenging or come with a lot of loss or grief, right? When we can find gratitude in each of the, gifts that were given, then life continues to expand and expand and expand and opportunities continue and you stay in this flow state of connection with your div divinity or your goddess. And so it becomes, you know, both a physical thing for orgasm and then it becomes a spiritual practice as well that can be strengthened over time. And then a woman has this kind of navigational certainty because she can begin to trust her body because she knows her orgasm, she knows how to come. And then she can begin to locate herself as that, that divine feminine spirit that life isn't working against her. It's actually for her that each even roadblock or challenge is for her growth, not to diminish her or to stop her. And so that's the why the it, the re, you know research on pleasure or the path of discovering what pleasures you is so crucial because it not doesn't just expand your ecstasy but it expands you spiritually and it kind of grounds you in a sense of like oh I I'm actually up to the task of this life I can triumph no matter what's in front of me and that gives w women a kind of confidence that she doesn't have without that connection to her body wow. and her pussy. That's so interesting. As you describe some of this, I think about kinesiology and how, especially the work of David Hawkins, who used kinesiology um, for non-local phenomenon, meaning like, is this vitamin good for you? You're strong or not strong, but is this thing true or is it in the highest good for me mm -hmm. and all, right? Um, but thinking about the body's nervous system as this tuning fork mm -hmm. for yes or not yes, right? Mm -hmm. This this um, embodied physicality of intuition, I guess you could say, right? Yeah. And thinking about the, what, 8,000 nerve endings yes. in a pussy, right? It makes- So it, good, you're so it, good. It makes a lot of sense, right? Because if there's 8,000 of those nerves, why are they there of like, all places, right, exactly. right? Like how come it's not under your arm or something, yeah. you know? But in, in, <laughs> in I'm just getting a, a, an idea here of, you know, by perhaps by opening up one's um, relationship to the that center specifically, mm -hmm. and all of that, you know, centralization of your nervous system right there. Perhaps that's part of the whole body and whole being kind of antenna system, mm -hmm. right? You're kind of a walking muscle test in exactly. a sense, for lack of a better term. Exactly. That's Ex really interesting. Yeah, it's so cool, and and. Um, if if you think about and it's if you think about it like eight thousand nerve endings dedicated to pleasure like it's you know and and there's no disease of the clit like the and the the clit will never atrophy she will always be there for you wow so you can oh and you can continue to expand and expand it's not like you have great sex in your twenties or thirties it's you can. Each decade can continue to not just expand you centrally, but attune you in a deeper way to your intuition, your spiritual growth and development, because you start to learn to be able to be like really ninja with your life, because you're never disconnected with that god-goddess place that pleasure brings you back to. You know, the, it... It, the, it used to be that the sacred and the sensual were one. It was just in the last 5,000 years of patriarchy that those two things were pulled apart. And it was pulled apart so that to give power to the church, you know, so that it would be 
uh, which it's amassed great power and wealth. But uh, when uh, and because it took the the god out of the feminine and put it in the church, so then, but when we bring it back to the feminine, then she is the holy. Then she's always home. She never loses her way, and she doesn't need to like, you know, ask for atonement on Yom Kippur. Or, <laughs> do a bunch of Hail Marys. She knows she's like observing her own life through her own integrity and finding the rightness within all of that. In your book, you do a bit of historical reference in terms yeah. of, you know, some older teachings in which the divine feminine was included, celebrated. Oh my God, aren't those stories unbelievable? Yeah, yeah that's wild. I mean, as a man listening to that, I'm like, wait, what? I never, <laughs> I never heard about this. Right? I'm, not, I'm not a religious person, but you know, just thinking about the context of that, uh, how you, I think right. about little nuns that are kind of subordinate to the, right on. the hierarchy, and I'm, I'm like, yeah. well, that's weird. You I know, know but, it's so crazy. It's such a misuse of all that beautiful feminine energy. One of my favorite ones is there's, I describe this yoni puja, where like it could be either a vessel or an actual body of a woman where when you want that transmission, there. Th this is um, a Hindu ceremony. You would put um, on a woman's pussy or on a vessel shaped like a pussy, you would pour uh, honey, oil, yogurt, milk, and water, standing for earth, air, fire, ether, um, and water, I guess. And then you t t make this liquid pour it on oh, the woman's pussy or this vessel to receive enlightenment or to, let's say, help to pray for the healing of somebody. Uh, and then the fluid was ingested because it was th this, you know, kind of like a really feminine communion. Um, you know, we have communion now, but it's not including the pussy of a woman, which is, of course, like, the seed of life itself, it would make sense that that's where holiness would occur. So I loved learning about all of those. Yeah, that was really fascinating. Craziness. Or, or even flashing your pussy <laughs> at the ocean to calm it down so that your right. husband would return from his fishing trip or flashing your pussy at the crops so they'll grow. Like women were just like these little kind of, I don't know, holy beings blessing everything wherever they went. People often ask me why I'm so obsessed with red light therapy. I've been doing it for years, and frankly, I plan to continue forever due to its incredible benefits. Thousands, yes, I said thousands, of peer-reviewed research articles have demonstrated the benefits of red and near-infrared light for things like skin health, reduced pain and inflammation, and faster muscle recovery. I love to do my red light first thing in the morning to get the red light I might get from watching the sunrise. And as red light therapies become so popular, there are several different red light therapy companies now, but I personally use and recommend Juve for a few reasons. First, they offer a wide selection of configurations from small handheld devices to large setups that can treat your entire body. I personally use both. Another feature I love with Juve's latest generation of products is something they called ambient mode which utilizes lower intensity red light designed to be used at night as a healthy alternative to bright blue light, which protects your melatonin levels and as a result, your sleep. This is what I use in the kitchen at night in our temporary apartment to balance out the blue light of the nasty overhead lighting. So if you want to get down with some red light, Juve has got you covered. And for a limited time, they're offering all my listeners, including you, an exclusive discount on your first order. Just go to juve.com slash Luke and apply my code Luke to your qualifying order. That's J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash Luke. And of course, some exclusions apply as this is a limited time offer. So hurry up and grab your Juve now. Something else I find interesting about your work, um, I, I think you sometimes describe yourself as a feminist. Or would you say that's a yeah. appropriate? Um, I'm curious your thoughts on like how your work is framed to me is what I would perceive to be a truer um, approach to feminism in that it's actually celebrating femininity. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. And there was, I don't know if it was the CIA and, you know, I, <laughs> that moved in and like corrupted kind of the women's movement in the 50s. I mean, there's a lot of theories. Gloria Stein, Steinem uh, was, you know, like basically a CIA operative. I mean, it's kind of known on historical record. And I've found it interesting and I've not gone that deeply into this stuff. You really need, to, after we're done, you need to tell me that Gloria Steinem in the CIA, but. Okay. <laughs> no, okay. no, for real. <laughs> Seriously. And that, you know, not to discount what progress she made, but there's, <laughs> it's like, there seem to be different waves of feminism, yes. right? And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. some of them, I think, to us men kind of make us bristle because they're inherently creating this competition or, or promoting this idea that we are the same, mm-hmm. right? Rather than we're equal. We're mm-hmm. equal, duh. Anyone like mm-hmm. with half a brain knows that there's no, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you, you don't value another human being over another human being based mm-hmm. on anything, right? We all have a divine right to life and everything that includes. But what what you're bringing forth is seems to be kind of unearthing what I perceive to be a more powerful strategy for creating equality and the celebration of the things that make women mm-hmm. unique and amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and that will, in fact, and I'm sure are motivating men like me and hopefully men listening to this to be in service of that and yeah. to support that, right? Yeah. I consider myself to be like fourth wave Um, feminism because feminism i mean it had to start with a lot of anger right okay we needed the right to vote you know we still don't have the equal rights amendment is still in isn't passed you know it's so women aren't equal in this country um but it had to start with a lot of anger because of you know disparity in uh, inability to vote in um wages etc so uh and then there were but this wave that I feel like I am part of uh, is a, a wave of feminism, which is women celebrating what it means to be a woman and bringing men into that vision and into that world and into that celebration so that we together can co-create and rise. That it's about, you know, because in, in the last waves, women were angry at men. Yeah, and I'm sure you've experienced yeah. that a lot in your life, in your dating life before you met your wife. Women are so pissed at men now, uh, you, for reasons that aren't personal. You know, it's things like you guys get a fifteen dollar haircut, we have to pay three hundred dollars. <laughs> Mine's forty, to be fair. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get your point. I get your point. Oh, but um, so it's it's like a, it, we have different opportunity now to um, actually invite men into a world that they have never seen or experienced, kind of like my student who had her guy with this headlamp. You know, it's like, let's, br- let's bring him. It, you, once we're, uh, f- we fall in love with ourselves, then it's easier to bring a guy into the magic and the beauty of exploring what is this feminine body? What what are her values? What is it that she sees and holds? Like, what are her priorities? And how can we together kind of like, you know, there's so many differences between us, but, you know, like a, a knife and a fork work perfectly together to, you know, e- eat a meal. It would be so awkward with one or the other. That's That's good. I like that one. Well, I think, yeah, that makes sense. It's almost like you have this collective pain body of the feminine or of women through eternity, right? Mm -hmm. And so in order to break out of a certain systemic oppression, you you actually maybe needed, collectively needed that energy of of anger, right? Because anger is, you know, it's a lower emotion, but it is motivating Mm -hmm. and it's better than apathy Mm -hmm. or shame where you just are a victim and you never move out of that victimhood. Mm -hmm. So it's empowering, but at a certain point, it also has limitations, yeah, right? And so perhaps what we're seeing with work like yours is um, a maturation of something that was needed, Mm. whose time has come Mm. and can be presented Mm -hmm. in a way that is unifying, truly, right? Because I think, Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up, with a mom who was, you know, born in the forties in Berkeley and was an adult through the sixties and was a feminist. And a lot of those ideas were, um, 
shared with me when I was young. And I'm, I'm sure I am who I am partially because of that. But mm-hmm. there was also a heavy dose of like men are fucked, you know, like right. men hating, you know, and as I yeah. become a, a more hopefully conscious and awake man, mm-hmm. that doesn't feel good. Like no. I'm, I'm on your side. Like right. I'm on your, t- I'm not trying to oppress anyone. Like yeah. go girl. Like yeah. the more huge my wife is, the more big successful, like I don't find that threatening at all mm-hmm. i'm I just i'm just in awe at mm-hmm. her majesty and and the more that i'm able to be privy to that experience of her being her fullest self it's like the more i love her and the more i want to support mm-hmm. her there's not you know what i mean i don't take yeah. it as an affront to my manhood or something because yeah. she doesn't hate men she she loves well at least this man she loves mm-hmm. and you know we have this really great synergy yeah so i don't know i just think about these things culturally sometimes you know it's like sometimes ideas get sort of um, waylaid through their different stages, and then and then arrive at something that's right. ultimately more productive. Right. It and, and it's important to recognize the history. Right. Like in when I was, I'm always studying the courtesans. I love them. But one of the reasons the courtesans were what gave rise to the women's movement because women, you know, back uh, a century or two ago, they weren't able to own property. They weren't able to own their own money. Like they were completely That's powerless so crazy. to That's their not husbands. That long ago their, either. I know it's we're not, not talking that about long ago. Ten thousand years no. ago, you know. No, and or it's you know, crazy. inheritance went to the son, not the daughter. It was so um, when, but the courtesans were the only free women. There were just a handful of them. You know, the women that were uh, able to be free and own their own money and own their own property, etc. So th- the women saw that. And they also wanted that freedom and that education. So that gave rise. They were angry and wanted equality. So they broke through and uh, made so much progress. But of course, in so doing, uh, feminism killed the courtesan, meaning the practices of of, um, exploring your sensuality, exploring pleasure. Those things went by the wayside because we were trying to imitate the what had men succeed. So I think that we're having an opportunity now to have both, have insane success, and also really explore uh, the m- majesty and beauty of the feminine and what lights us up, what turns us on, what... Um, our bodies long for and uh, have that be a huge part of intimate conversations, especially because, you know, what other reason is there for partnership now, except that your life can get more and more pleasurable because your wife is in it and that her life gets more and more pleasurable because you're in it. And that wasn't the setup. That's not why our parents or grandparents got married. They got married to put a roof over our heads and put food on the table, but it's a whole different world now. And we don't have a lot of education in how to explore one another's pleasure or even how to explore our own pleasure. So it's like this whole new world. So cool. Yeah. Um, Okay, there's a lot more I want to cover here. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask you about. I've, I've heard you touch on this briefly, but uh, not really dive into it. So dive into whatever degree mm-hmm. you want, but it is the um, circumcision of men, which is so prevalent in the United States. And, Isn't it crazy? Yeah. And as a circumcised man, uh, I never thought about it my whole life right. until I start, you know, started doing this podcast and interviewing people yeah. about it. And I realized, wow, we have modern day genital mutilation well, going on yeah, here we do. and it's the norm and it's i've the norm. looked at my i'm sorry listeners i talk about myself so much in the podcast <laughs> but it's my only point of reference is subjectivity <laughs> sometimes but this and this goes for many men that i know some of us are more tapped into it but it's a massive massive injury to massive. the psyche of a man mm-hmm. and i know this because as i've become more intimate with myself and in my relationships and looking at my past um, not only relationships to, you know, in the nature of sexual relationships, but just relationships with everything and everyone in the world. And it's this desensitization because of that trauma that 
prevents men mm-hmm. from having the the male version of the experience you describe with the pussy with our cocks, mm-hmm. right? There's like there's a huge part of our experience is missing, mm-hmm. and in our ability to have that finer level of of sensitivity, mm-hmm. not just in our mm-hmm. genitals, but as as beings, mm-hmm. right? And so, um, I consider myself kind of in in recovery of that experience. And something I've had to do a bit of grieving about, right. you know, in and, and some pretty deep ways and to kind of really just accept and acknowledge that mm-hmm. that, that uh, unfortunately happened to me. Mm-hmm. Um, what's, what's your take on how that might be affecting, um, you know, men and their psyche and their ability to, to understand women and coexist and co-create? Yeah, I agree with you. I think it is a, um, it's so traumatizing to the bodies of those little baby boys and to our men. And there's actually 350 million women who've experienced female genital mutilation, which is far more radical and damaging than circumcision. But nevertheless, both are an effort to control the sexuality and subjugate and subdue and diminish that primal drive, which is where the sacred enters the body. And so I I think it's amazing that you've been able to, you know, do that kind of recovery on yourself. I think that every man requires it because it's a, 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 and it's still continuing today. It's just, you know, part of the call. I think it's shocking and terrible. And I'm, if I had had a son, I would have, grabbed him and fled before anyone got <laughs> no doubt. near his no doubt well i think about it like a complaint that the the world often has or or women let's say is you know men are so insensitive like they're not tapped mm-hmm. into how mm-hmm. we feel and they're just yeah. brutes right they're just yeah. clumsy brutes going through our lives and aren't aren't caring and aware and i think God, if if you want men to be more sensitive, like maybe stop lobbing their cocks on half. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. dude, it's brutal. You're yeah. you're getting cut off from part of that experience. Yeah, and, totally. And speaking to, um, and I've, I've watched some videos and, and met men who are what they call intact, right? Just God given the way it was designed. Um, men who are intact have it's very common for them to have extended orgasms, multiple mm-hmm. orgasms, different types of orgasms. Mm-hmm. It's a whole mm-hmm. different sexual experience, mm-hmm. you know, about mm-hmm. which I will never know, unfortunately. But when I hear men talk about what sex is like for them, I'm like, oh, I know nothing about that because there's parts missing that would facilitate that more rich, deep experience. Right. You know, a circumcised guy in America, you grow up maybe looking at dirty magazines, watching pornography, and you just, your, your purview of sex is like just pummeling mm-hmm. a pussy, right? And mm-hmm. the, the finer nuances of that mm-hmm. experience I think are mm-hmm. less attainable you mm-hmm. know, for a man who I don't know. Let's see, let me think about that is it less attainable not that I, it's I think, impossible but I think that the one of the most difficult parts is overcoming all of the predispositions of our culture to attune men to pornography and I think that um, you know, there's so many things you can you can study tantra and breathing and uh, you, which I'm sure you and your wife have done things like that or your that's on the agenda. Like it's there there we have to. It's not just women that have to. You know, I call my book "Pussy: A Reclamation." It's not just women who have to reclaim. It's men as well. Like all of us have to like reclaim our relationship with pleasure and uh, and our own sensuality and find our way to like attune ourselves to even those like little delicate nuances of connection with our own bodies and then with our partner's bodies. It's like this infinite exploration that's in front of us. Like the pleasure research never has to end. There's always something more you can learn. I'm sure, you know. Yeah, I, that's that's a good point. You know, thinking about, um, I think it's called a, a morphogenic field where, say, someone loses a limb. Yeah. 
but they still are able to feel mm-hmm. as though they have one, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> there's there's got to be some sort of uh, morphogenic field of a circumcised cock, right. you know, in a sense where like there are other, just because some nerves are gone, there's ways to perhaps access yeah. a more full and rich Yeah, and experience. also, like, let's say what we know about pain, there's a limit to the amount of pain you can have, and then you'll die. There, it's You'll max out. But there's no limit to pleasure. There's no upper limit. Like wow. you can continually explore more and more and more. You can get more intense, longer duration. Like there's limitlessness there. So I feel like that the odds are in your favor. That's really you interesting. You got this kid. I actually never, and you know, <laughs> not to say that I haven't enjoyed sex and continue to, you know, it's just, it's one of those things, um, you know, you look back on your life and are introspective and you think, man, if I could, if anything could have been done differently or if I could, mm-hmm. could have done anything differently. And I think for, for many men, that's one about which they had no choice. Right. Mm-hmm. So you just, you just kind of slough it off and, oh, wow, this is the way it is. But mm-hmm. I think it's helpful to acknowledge if that's your story, maybe not all men feel it. I'm sure many don't care, but um, if that is your story, I think there's a core wound there that would be best served to mm-hmm. at least Mm-hmm. And Don't, and you know, speaking of core wounds, I mean, I've had students in my class who have had female genital mutilation where their clitorises have been removed or oh their my God. exterior genitalia or interior genitalia. And there are um, surgeries that can provide a tremendous amount of recovery. Really? Yeah. Wow. But additionally, you can also sensitize so that even if the clitoris is missing, there's the root of the clitoris that extends into the body. And with practice, you can sensitize what remains so that you can just expand. I've, I've had women who have become orgasmic, who had, who had female genital mutilation because they have put in the work to like, really sensitize their bodies. They overcame their shame. They began a practice of self-pleasuring so they could relearn their instrument. And uh, there, and there's so many nerve endings. There's 8,000 nerve endings. There's, there's so many nerve endings in the exterior genitalia and the vulva that you can create a tremendous amount of pleasure. I wonder how many nerve endings there are in an intact male I wonder genitalia. intact versus I, I heard it's 4,000 in the head of a cock but oh. I wonder what that is if the guy is intact yeah. I wonder if it's different we need yeah. to find that out yeah like. <laughs> I should have researched that when I was making my notes <laughs> um, but uh, th- you know thank you for kind of going there with me it's something I've, I've talked to a few people about on the podcast as I said my awareness around it has grown and, and I feel mm-hmm. a, a duty to put it out there for parents to be, you know, no shame, no shame to any parents that have elected to do it. No shame for those that do, but it's something that I think, um, Mm -hmm. you should just be aware of. Yeah, I agree. Um, let's see here. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything on my notes here. I really, I took a lot of them. (laughs) Thank you. And, and I love when I sit, I sit down with someone, uh, and with us, it was totally this way. I had a feeling it would be that like the notes become irrelevant. Mm-hmm. And so you just flow with it. And it's way better than if I followed yeah. some linear plan. Mm-hmm. But the times I do that and then the guest leaves and I look at my notes, I'm like, ah, I forgot. <laughs> you know, I really wanted to talk about that thing. So I think that um, that's why I had this. Thank you for particular taking one. such good notes. I yeah, appreciate yeah. it. So sweet. Perhaps now, more than ever, humanity is under an incredible amount of stress. Hell, even when the world's not this insane, normal life can be stressful. And aside from just being uncomfortable, stress can take a toll on your body, raising your blood pressure, making it harder to sleep, draining you of vital energy, and making you more irritable. That's why I strongly recommend that you supplement with magnesium daily. A shocking 75% of people are magnesium deficient. That number might be even higher among business owners and C-level professionals. That's because stress depletes magnesium levels. And this can, of course, trigger a vicious cycle of rising stress and severe magnesium deficiency. This magnesium stuff is so important that it's involved in over 300 chemical processes inside your body. It's a critical mineral. Having enough magnesium can give you better sleep, more energy, healthy blood pressure, 
less irritability, a calmer mood, stronger bones, reduced muscle cramping, and even fewer migraines. Sounds awesome, right? Well, to experience these health benefits, you have to get the right kinds of magnesium, and most synthetic magnesium supplements just don't cut it. That's why I recommend Magnesium Breakthrough by Bioptimizers. It's the only organic, full-spectrum magnesium supplement that includes seven unique forms of magnesium for stress relief and better sleep all in one bottle. This stuff's incredible, and I actually took one this morning before I left the house. I was thinking about that as I record these ads. I'm like, okay, when did I use it last? Yep, it was today and almost every day. So for an exclusive offer for you Lifestylist Podcast listeners, go to magbreakthrough.com slash Luke and use the code Luke10 at checkout to save 10% off and get free shipping. That's magbreakthrough.com slash Luke and use the code Luke10. In a woman, I know I know where I want to go with this next. In a woman, you know, getting in touch with her pussy and this feminine energy and and the radiation that starts to mm-hmm. be created in that relationship. Um, you talk a lot about flirting and how healthy flirting is. Mm-hmm. And then at one point in your book, you I think use these words: the difference between flirting and hustling. And that kind of led me into an inquiry around. I don't know if I'd call it like toxic. Um, feminine energy or what I could categorize it as, Mm -hmm. but like the manipulative seductress with like a taker Mm -hmm. energy versus Mm -hmm. a woman in her full expression of just Mm -hmm. that, that radiance. Mm -hmm. What, what, what do you mean by um, hustling and flirting and the difference therein? When I teach women about flirtation, it's really um, flirtation is really nothing more, nothing less than enjoying yourself in the presence of another person. That's flirting. And it elevates everyone when a woman is willing to flirt because she's alive and she's radiant. She's plugged into her, uh, you know, she's turned on. And so, it's, and it doesn't, and it doesn't mean anything. You know, she could be flirting with the doorman or flirting with the guy who's selling Metro cards in the subway. She she's just be, feeling herself. She's feeling herself yeah, and everybody's yeah. grooving to her, feeling herself beat. Uh, so that's the, you know, the purity of flirtation and flirtations in our DNA as women. We flirt with puppies on the street, you know, my God, a cute little puppy. We flirt with babies, you know, it's, uh, and it's a wonderful practice because uh, a world filled with turned on flirtatious women is a far better, more fun world than a world filled with turned off, uh, angry women that aren't connected to their source energy. So that's the purity of flirtation. And women often resist flirtation because they don't want to be like, oh, wow, I don't want my friend to think that I want to steal her husband. Or um, I don't want to, you know, just like think that, you know, he he has to buy me a drink or something, you know. Um, But there, of course, women who are very aware of their sexual power and who, you know, maybe they they go out hoping someone will buy them drinks that night, or you know, they maybe they they want they are a woman seeking arrangements with a, a gentleman and exchanging sexual favors for cash or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, the the your sexual energy is that powerful, and uh, but that it's it's not. It's not a commerce. It's simply right. to elevate the woman. And when she's elevated, she elevates the world. Right. Because in that commerce-based interaction, it becomes um, transactional. It does. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I really picked up from the, the the orgasmic meditation thing is just, even just in terms of a I mean, I wouldn't even call that necessarily a sexual interaction per se, if you follow the confines yeah. of that model Mm -hmm. but that was something that was totally foreign to me was like wait it's not a tit for tat right thing right Mm -hmm. it's just it's it's not transactional in any way it's just it's just a it's a receiving Mm -hmm. on behalf of the owner of the clit right exactly and that was kind of revelatory to me because before that i don't think i knew any other way that it could be yeah you know in terms of i don't know just that weird exchange where 
one feels ingratiated to make sure the other other one climaxes mm-hmm. and you know it's just it's mm-hmm. just weird like why right why are we conditioned that way rather than just in, enjoying each other's company and everything just feels good and no one owes anything anyone mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and don't you love it when you're just able to give your wife pleasure i mean it's That's so fulfilling it's like and likewise it's so fulfilling for me with uh, you know, I, sometimes I like to give and sometimes I like to receive. I would say that I'm definitely, I veer towards pillow princess. I just want to lie back and receive as much as I possibly can. <laughs> pillow princess. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But I love to give. It's so much yeah. fun. Um, you talk about this idea of a radiant relationship mm-hmm. in your book, which I really enjoyed. Could you expand yeah. on, on that teaching a bit? Yeah. You know, I'm probably n- n- not somebody that... F- is falls into the really monogamous category. I think I'm always going to be open in all of my relationships. I've been married and I've had partners, but I always love to, um, the, the reason I call it a radio relationship is because I think it's really important when a couple is together that they choose their destiny and they choose the like the level of um, devotion to each other, and sometimes in a monogamous relationship, it can be fun to open a door and include another experience. Should that work for both parties in the partnership? If it only works for one partner, then it is a really bad idea, and you should not do it. Agreed. But if it works for both people. I think it's uh, liberating and fun to consider including um, the possibility of conscious connections with other partners if it's pleasurable. And if it's, and for some couples, monogamy is the radiant relationship. There's, you know, each, each of us is an infinite being. There's always more we can learn about one another and pleasure is infinite. So you can have a radiant relationship within a monogamous partnership that continues and expands centrally over a lifetime. And you can also do that with having a partnership that includes other, or in some cases, uh, a radiant relationship is not even being part of a single partnership, but having several partners. I think it's really, we live in a world where you can make decisions that speak to uh, honoring the kind of how you operate and what serves your own aliveness. And I think that very often in relationships, uh, women especially have been taught to shut down that which makes them alive. Um, And so my book is really about giving uh, women and men the opportunity to be conscious about what that is that makes you feel the most alive and include it in your partnership in a way that serves both of you. In terms of ha- having a relationship that is uh, more open and not yeah. monogamous, having tried that myself and <laughs> ultimately found it to not not work uh, for anyone involved, but um, it's like, how do I phrase this? I don't sense from your energy that you're someone who is withholding part of yourself and is afraid of being hurt and is love avoidant, right? Yeah. Just speaking in, in the classical term of like mm-hmm. a love avoidant, which I was very good at for a long time. <laughs> how, how, how does one maybe determine within themselves whether they're seeking more variety in their sexual life because it's just in their nature or stage there in their life or someone who perhaps is choosing that as an option because they're afraid to get close to people and afraid to be vulnerable and get hurt. Good question. And that's where it becomes um, about deepening your intimacy with your partner. Because, you know, I, I, I love partnership. I think it's like evolutionarily the only place we can really transcend and become the people we were born to be because, you know, I've I pretty much maxed out single woman. You know, I know how to do it really, really well. 
And I've had amazing partnerships in my life that I've been privileged to share. And I always feel like I'm much more on the razor's edge of myself of really growing and changing when I'm inside of a partnership. I love that so much. But um, I think that there's so much uh, that takes place. Like when I was it married and I would have a flirtation or, you know, I would see somebody and I would be turned on or, and I would go back and say to my husband, like, well, I had this experience where I met this person. I felt a lot of turn on. And then we brought that into our partnership one way or another, whether we um, talked about it and it became part of our own lovemaking or whether my partner would say, well, would, what would you like to do about that? Do you want to include that? If so, in what way? And then we would talk about how that might be. You know, I found that when I was in partnership and including others, there was so much more talking that had to take place than actually doing something with another person. Right. Because yeah. is you really have to make sure that it's step together, step touch, that we're both on the same page. We're both honoring each other. And and sometimes the fun is just even in thinking about what could happen, but bringing the turn on back home to your main squeeze. That can be a very complex negotiation. Dude. <laughs> and, and I, don't, I don't miss it. I'm like yeah. so happy to be monogamous. Yeah. I, I'm just done, you know, mm -hmm. so at home. But I, I, I think that's interesting as, I don't know, I guess as people start to awaken to themselves and think, you know, I want to be polyamorous or whatever, you know, at what point is it just a natural way that you are? And at what point are you just afraid of actually true intimacy? And yeah, so you, you I know, don't know. Yeah. I think it's a good question and yeah. one that probably, um, you know, is it is important to pursue because you want to always do the things that terrify you. Yeah, <laughs> And if real intimacy is terrifying, then it's definitely like a powerful direction for you to learn more and more and more about who you are and yeah. what and, you stand and for. And perhaps for some people, um, true intimacy is not terrifying, right? And so mm -hmm. they're, they're liberated. In I don't that. know if I ever met anybody that wasn't scared of true intimacy. Yeah. Did you? Uh, well, I can, you know, speaking for myself, definitely not. <laughs> but, uh, but, I definitely have arrived at that place, I think, you know, yeah. where there's there's no breaks, there's no holding out. It's mm -hmm. just fully open, fully vulnerable, Amazing. willing willing to be blown apart if that's what mm -hmm. happens, you know, mm -hmm. it's just in in service of the 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 broad love. Um it, there's no no price that wouldn't be make that make make it worth it mm -hmm. to do that, to really yeah. just give oneself into something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, how has your daughter responded to the work that you do? I think with a lot of eye rolling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mom, like, oh, really? Did you have to post that on Instagram? Like, what do you matter with you? Or, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, but I think she's also very proud of me. Um, and I think it goes, it's, it's a healthy dance between rolling her eyes and feeling like, oh, no, that's cool what you did, what you made happen. And what about what about your mom? I think at the time of your book writing, your mom was working with you. Oh, in she your business? totally works for me. Yeah, and yeah. Um, she loves it. And but this was a long process, right? In the beginning, everyone thought I was mad as a hatter mm -hmm. to be teaching courses about pussy and sensuality and pleasure, and that it would go nowhere good and all of that. So, um, but then. I gave her a job and she became the bubby <laughs> at the workshops that I teach. And <laughs> who doesn't want one of those? Like a grandma, you know, yeah. that you can like cry in their lap and they'll stroke your hair and send you back out there to be fabulous. It's, she, so she's, she's found it. She's embraced it. Completely. Wow. Completely. So cool. As if it was her idea. No. Wow. Yeah. What a great, I mean, you know, despite the eye rolling, that's a pretty incredible lineage lineage healing right of like yeah for sure that's a couple generations of women coming into their own and 
opening to ideas that expand you rather than contract you. Mm-hmm. It's very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that part of your book. I was like trying to picture your mom. You know, how <laughs> how many years of age is your mom now? My mom is ninety seven. <laughs> That's so good. And she's Just, worked with me really since my daughter was little because she used to come in to babysit for my daughter that when. I was teaching. Oh, okay. And then she was, after my daughter got older and not in, so needy of her, yeah. she'd be like, well, what am I doing here? I need a job. And then I was like, she needs a job. Hmm, what could she be? Oh, we need the ancestors. Yeah. You know, like, it's not just about young people finding their way. It's like, w- we want that intergenerational community. And I've got like, grandmas, granddaughters, moms from families that take my work. Um, You know, sometimes like whole extended family, the aunties, the the daughters, the the whole thing. Um, So I thought, well, I might as well give my mom a job. She's very happy to do it. Oh, that's really cool. Um, And at this point, are you doing any teaching for men or is it all exclusively women at this point? Uh, Right now it's women, but... um, my favorite thing is teaching men, to really? be honest. I loved it so much. I loved working with your guys. And that was that a great day. Night. It was totally amazing. Um, what I, It's just sort of, that's the pathway that opened for me. And yeah. then whenever I teach, I always do like one day for men or one weekend for men. I do a small mastermind and I, oh, I, and I have a weekend for guys. So I haven't uh, stop teaching men, but mostly I'm teaching women these days. Yeah, that night that we had was pretty wild. I I, I had no expectations and just I, that's kind of just how I show up for things. I don't need to know about it. I just yeah. feel into it and it mm-hmm. feels good. I'm going to do it. But yeah, I remember um, we did one exercise where we were getting in touch with our anger, mm-hmm. you know, and that and, was wild. And things like that make me feel really awkward. Yeah. You know? It's like, I don't mm-hmm. know. I'm just not expressive in that way generally and i was like well i'm you know i'm not going to be the guy that's like i'm too cool for this or too embarrassed so i'm like okay i went all in it was incredible how much anger i had isn't it great i was like oh oh my god i am fucking pissed because i was (laughs) i was dealing with this house stuff you know so i was like "Hmm, what am i annoyed about oh it's right there man and (laughs) and i went off um but what was even more interesting was knowing when it was all out too because then i was like well everyone else is still doing it and I could tell when it was forced yeah. and it wasn't real. I thought, wow, what a beautiful yeah. practice. I mean, imagine if 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 more men had just access to right, that. the wherewithal oh to just go God. go in your car and just scream for yeah. five minutes, right? Yeah. And just but it's also, get it out of your body. It's really important to be witnessed. You know, oh. it, it's that's a huge aspect of it. The thing that we're talking about is something I describe in my book, which is a practice called swamping that you wouldn't think would stem from pussy, but it actually does because what happens is as soon as a woman kind of connects with her sensuality and her aliveness, all of the rage at being repressed for thousands of years starts bubbling forward or all of the places in which she was physically violenced, raped, abused, um, you know, date raped, whatever, molested on the subway, what, whatever those things that have happened to, you know, 99% of women in their lives. And so the, in my work, I realized like, wow, all of this emotion comes up when a woman starts to educate herself about her body and her sensuality. So we need to not push it down, but give it a container So I created this practice called swamping, which is you deliberately choose to connect to whatever that storyline is that's about your rage or your grief or your frustration or your jealousy or your despair. And then we put on a couple of songs and then as a community or group, move through the fullness of the emotion, which you can move through because you know it's a container of a song. You can give yourself, you know, banging on the pillows or doing karate kicks or like banging the floor, or leaping, running around the room, or in that case, wrestling each other, which the women do too, hmm. fully, because you got this three-minute container to right. express it all, and then it's done. And then the grief in the container, and then it's done. And then returning home 
with sensuality because when you you can't leave all that raw emotion hanging out you have to kind of draw it back in bring it back into the body and ground it through sensuality and then you can kind of move on with your day and create more trouble well can you imagine a world where people had the skill to manage their emotion oh in that God. way right? oh just think about it's how, my dream i'm gonna make that happen how many i've got more years in me you do of course how many societal <laughs> problems and inter- it's solved you know, yeah, I mean, interpersonal, but I mean, even uh, bigger, right? I, yeah. You just go on Twitter and look at the, you know, the oh trauma that people are acting out. It's like, God, if we just knew how to really surrender into yeah. those those feelings and, and express them in a mm-hmm. way that doesn't... Because when they get stuck and mm-hmm. repressed, it's like, that's when shit gets really yeah. crazy. And, you know? you know, my daily practice, like, I do not start a day without doing a rage and a grief and then a turn on. Really? I'm, wow. I'm like very emotional and I like it. So yeah. I just like keeping, giving myself a chance to express it. And usually I'll grab a girlfriend and Zoom with her and do it because wow. it wants to be witnessed. So you practice what you preach. I have to, otherwise I'd be a cranky ass bitch. I want to, good. Thank you for not being that. <laughs> we would have had a way less fun podcast. <laughs> I want to share one thing with you on that um, that I think might be, I don't know, helpful to maybe both, but primarily men who have a difficult time holding a woman when she's in her full expression. Mm -hmm. Uh, A number of years ago, I did a a workshop by this guy, John Wineland, who's been on the podcast. He's like a kind of in the school of David data. Yeah, I know John. So one of the exercises we did, it was, it was equal men and women. And I was single at the time I was on a celibate journey and just doing a lot of inner work. Um, I brought a homie with me and, and they needed two more guys. And there were a couple single women, but mostly couples. So equal number of males and females. And they split us on two sides of the room and put like a, you know, dividing line between and then instructed the men to kind of stand at the line and then instructed the women to bring as much rage as they possibly could Mm -hmm. to the surface out of their bodies. Mm -hmm. And our job was to stand there and hold space. So, you know, 30 different women coming up and just screaming, you know, Mm -hmm. all of that. All Were they that, pounding on your chest or just screaming? There was at you? no touching. Okay, but it was—I mean, it was mm-hmm. hard to hold, right? Mm-hmm. And I had never seen women, not one woman, even go there, right? But that wall of just mm-hmm. generational trauma and rage mm-hmm. and whatever, and that single experience helped me so much in my relationships to learn how to attune my nervous system. To just to handle to it, to handle that, and yeah. to be there for that, yeah. and I use that all the time in my current relationship. That's, That's great. how I hold space. Yeah, it's great without without personalizing yeah. it or feeling attacked or defensive mm-hmm. or wanting to fix it or any of that shit. It's just like yeah. becoming this absorbent sponge of energy yeah. that's just like give me everything. Just I want to lay it on me. Yeah, that's so good. It I was wanna, really cool. I want to add one more thing, which okay. is that when she comes at you with that level of rage and frustration, that is such a compliment because she trusts you that much. Like you are the man that can hold that for her. She doesn't give that gift to anybody but you. And so it's like such a huge act of love that you that she's trusting you that big and that you're holding space for her that much it's so intimate and so delicious and yeah beautiful yeah thank you for the for that insight yeah but hey fellas out there like (laughs) you'd have a much better life and better relationships if you if you learn how to you know just be that container. Mm-hmm. It's an overused word. I'm like, everyone's like, container, container. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. There's no other way to say it. But yeah. And I find another way that is really useful to get there um, is through the breath, too. Mm-hmm. When I find myself contracting and yeah. like, oh, feeling. And, you know, yeah. it's not like we have a very conflict free relationship, but just mm-hmm. in her life, just living, right? There's just mm-hmm. emotions that need to be processed. And, uh, I find if I'm if I find myself holding my breath, I'm, I start to get fidgety. Yeah, and if I can just breathe and just actually physically open my body language as mm-hmm. well is another really useful tool of just like really receiving it. Yeah, so not like you know legs crossed, arms crossed, like trying to deflect, mm-hmm. but just like give me all that, mm-hmm. and it's it's a beautiful experience. Yeah, you know it's a really um, a mutually loving experience actually, and the net benefit is that things get moved through very quickly. Yeah. Too. That's great. Yeah. So 
<laughs> yeah. Hopefully that's helpful. And thank mm-hmm. you for verifying that. And, yeah, and also totally. um, the reflection of, mm-hmm. you know, when two people are really able to be there for one another in that way, it, it does require a lot of trust mm-hmm. from both, yep. you know, perhaps. Yeah. Well, hot damn. All right. Last question for you today is uh, who are three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life and your work that you might share with us? Hmm. I would say, um, well, the work of Moore University, Dr. Victor Barranco, Lafayette Morehouse, that was like the cornerstone and the game changer for me and probably um, such an important building block. Um, Maya Angelou, I used to listen to her poem, And Still I Rise, you know, like starting to create a business that was around pussy and (laughs) pleasure and women, you know, when I had a newborn daughter and have the courage, I thought, well, if Maya Angelou could rise and stand as if she has diamonds at the meeting of her thighs, I can do the same. So I would, um, I was really inspired by her and also the work of Audre Lorde, who is a feminist uh, writer, uh, activist, who wrote an essay called The Use of the Erotic as Power. And um, she just was like validating so many of the things that I was learning and discovering in my own work that how the erotic is, um, you know, almost this sacred source of inspiration that when we can include and serve that erotic, it gives meaning to whatever it is we're doing, whether we're scrubbing a toilet or um, making love to our partner. Um, the, that erotic aliveness is uh, a gift that um, women have this power to connect to and to use that eroticism for our own lives rather in service to men or our families or etc that really guided me like I'm on the right path I'm on the right path so those were two women that really helped me um stay the course uh, awesome thank you for sharing yeah uh for those listening you can find links to everything that was just mentioned in this conversation at lukestory.com slash mama gina g-e-n-a and we'll put links to your website and social media Thank and you. all of those things. Uh, is there anything you want to point people to? Do you have any courses you want to invite uh, folks to check yeah. out right now? I have. Uh, I'm right now. When will this thing? Probably go? a couple months. Okay, you know, six eight weeks, something like that. Okay, usually, gr- that'll be amazing timing. I'm just about to kick in m- March. I believe yes, in March I'm doing a, an amazing course called Virtual Pleasure Bootcamp. Which is <laughs> Sounds good. eight weeks long. And it's like your basic primer of how do you start to connect to your pleasure? How do you start to connect to your pussy? How do you start to connect to your power? And I teach it myself live on Zoom for wow. eight weeks. And it's such a blast. And it creates such a great sisterhood and such a great community. God, I would so love to be a fly on the wall for that. <laughs> I know I can't. I'm not you can't. literally <laughs> suggesting, but like, wow, that would be really interesting. Um, well, I'll tell you what, if you, it, it should be after that, but you just keep in touch with me and, you know, I can put this out whenever I okay. want, basically, you know, so we'll, we'll make sure that that's available to the listeners when this comes out. Okay. So just Amazing. You know, give me the green light and I'll put it on the calendar for them. Okay. Perfect. Well, great to see you again. Thank you so much for you making too, the time Luke. to come hang out. Yeah. It's funny when I met you that night uh, and drove you back to your hotel while we were driving, I was like, man, she'd be great on my podcast. I should ask her. And I just had so much going on that couple of days. And I didn't know what your schedule was. I think you were yeah. flying out the next day. And I was like, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'll just leave it alone. Maybe I'll email her someday or something like that. And then um, Emily Fletcher, former guest and friend, inter- introduced us again uh, for this. And I was like, see, there you go. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like that's the, right. The art- you trusted your pussy. Yeah, yeah, totally. The art of allowing, you mm-hmm. know, because I was like, she's, she would be great for the show. I knew that. I, when I feel that, that's always very certain. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the logistics of it, sometimes the universe yeah. has to take a minute to catch up. So yeah, it's I'm great. glad it did. And thanks for the ride that night. It really meant a lot to me. I appreciated it so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Anytime. Well, I don't know about you, but I learned a lot in this conversation, man. What a joy to get to sit down with Mama Gina and uh, just expand my own awareness and consciousness in general. I feel so fortunate to be able to meet people like her 
and share time in person, you know, to actually sit in a room and really get down into the nitty gritty. And while I'm so grateful for technologies like Zoom and the fact that we can have virtual meetings and podcasts, uh, I much prefer the real life face to face experience. And I think that um, as a result of uh, doing that, most of the time, you as the end uh, result or listener of these conversations uh, probably benefits more than you would if uh, we were dealing with the static of the interweb. So much gratitude here. I've got a lot to unpack. There was a lot covered here. Uh, some of my presumptions and beliefs, I think, were challenged here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it's always um, an exploration for me in, in conversations like this where I'm getting to expand my consciousness. And I trust that you were able to do the same. If you found this conversation as enlightening as I did, I humbly request that you share it with someone you love, you know, someone that's interested in self-empowerment and probably more than anything, empowering relationships, right? I think as uh, humans, the more we can learn about each other, especially those that are different from ourselves, you know, whatever the polar opposite energetically or genetically happens to be, that the world will be a better place. So thank you so much for sharing this episode with a friend. Um, that's really the number one way you can you know, help support what we're doing here. If you want to check out our sponsors, that's always awesome and encouraged. But this show is, and I think if I can manage it, will always be free. So uh, all I ask is that you listen, really. If you want to go a step further, share it with a friend. It would mean a lot to me and, of course, to our guests. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, for those of you that want to go a bit deeper with the work of uh, Gina... You can find her Virtual Pleasure Bootcamp course at virtualpleasurebootcamp.com. Of course, everything we talked about in this show can be found in the show notes at lukestory.com slash Mama Gina. And just so you know, on most podcast apps, you can actually click on the links that are part of the show notes. So I think sometimes people don't realize if you, you know, look in the show notes on the actual app, you can click on things and find things. And I think some people aren't aware of that because I get messages like, hey, where's the transcripts? Where's the show notes for this episode? And I think to myself, well, I checked on the app and they're right there. So if you want to find it on a website, I always give you the links, but you can just click around on the show notes on most podcast players and uh, get where you want to go. I will be speaking at Paleo FX for the fourth time this year. Really excited about that here in Austin, Texas. That's April 29th through May 1st. You can get tickets for that event and any events at which I am participating at lukestory.com slash events. And with that, my friends, I want to thank you so much for listening. And uh, man, I'm just extremely excited to be able to bring you these episodes and you can count on me to keep them coming. 2022 has been a hell of a year for us and I'm doing everything I can to bring you guests that are going to help, help you thrive and uh, stay sane in these challenging times in which we find ourselves. So thank you so much and I'll be back next week. 